Welcome back on the second day of Fragile by Example. There are many inspiring talks behind us, but there are more interesting talks ahead of us. So stay tuned for more Agile by Example. Our first speaker today on Yellow Stage will be Stefani Gasha. Welcome, Stefani. Thank you. Uh, Stefani comes from Austria. She works as independent consultant, helping teams, leaders, and whole companies to apply Agile in their organization. In her work, she used trend metrics and continuous improvement methods. Her talk is very interesting to me because me and my colleague Scrum Master constantly struggle with quantifying our work, sometimes for ourselves to help our grow, sometimes for our employers. But it is not easy to assess Scrum Master role. So I'm thrilled to hear your approach to this topic, Stephanie. Thank you, Michael. Um, so before we start into the talk of measuring performance, quantifying the work of a Scrum Master, I would actually like to hear how many more Scrum Masters apart from Michael are actually in this session now. Um, so I would like to get, a, let's say, a gist, um, a brief understanding of you as an audience. Um, could you perhaps post into, I think the Slack channel would probably be the best place to do that, um, what role you're in. So why are you listening to this talk? How are you? Are you a Scrum Master? Are you connected to a Scrum Master? Are you working with them? So maybe just post that into the chat and I'll be um, having a look right now just to see who's... How many Scrum Masters there are? I can see some SM, AC... <laughs> Thank you for those abbreviations. <laughs> nice. Okay, so I would say most people are probably here because they are either Scrum Masters or have something to do with Scrum Masters. So that's good. Um, and while the 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 um, organizational plumber interesting <laughs> so while these are coming in I would um, just continue and actually tell you a bit about myself so who I am um, Michael already said that I'm from Vienna I'm from Austria this is also where I'm living right now in between I lived worked got educated um, in France and Germany in the UK and the US um, and in 2012, my journey in the Agile world started as I became a Scrum Master, an interim Scrum Master, actually, because most of the time over the past nine years, I've been working as a, um, as a consultant, as a coach, but as an external person most of the time. What do I do? Um, I consider myself a change manager. I consider myself a trainer. I consider myself an organization developer. I consider myself a, a Scrum Master, an Agile coach, an Agile consultant. But also, since I founded two um, social impact startups, um, one in the area of neighborhood help, one in the area of refugee integration slash immig uh, immigrant uh, integration, I also consider myself um, sometimes an interim product owner, I would say. So why am I actually talking about Scrum Master performance today? Um, as I said, I... Well, no, I haven't mentioned that yet. Um, for the past three years, I've actually been an independent Agile coach. I've been working as an independent consultant. And every time I come into an organization that says, okay, well, we're going Agile now, or we're in the midst of an Agile transition, um, and we are doing Scrum, a lot of Scrum, um, I can see one statement that is actually across all of my clients. Yes, every Scrum team, or at least you know, every two Scrum teams must have one Scrum Master. Um, this is something we can definitely all agree on. This is, you know, th this is a fact by now, so that's good. But on the other hand, when I actually ask, okay, so do you talk to your Scrum Masters? So like, what is the impact that you're expecting of them? This is kind of the reaction that I get. So there's very let's say very uh, little talk about what are we actually expecting from a Scrum Master. And this is kind of what I want to talk about today. And I have quite a few um, ideas of how we can measure the impact, of how we can make sure that the impact that this is expected of a Scrum Master is actually being reached. Um, but before I go into my ideas, because these are just ideas, um, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect. Um, I would like you to actually, again, 
look into the Slack chat, um, Slack channel, and actually post in there. What impact do you expect from a great Scrum Master? How would you notice that? Plus, how would you measure that? So I will again be looking into um, the Slack channel. And I am waiting for your um, reflections, for your posts. This is always the moment where, you know, <laughs> people are pondering, people are reflecting, people are posting, which is good. Remove blockers, team continuously improving. Smooth collaboration. And how would you measure that? Nothing changes when he is not present. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so it seems that there is an expectation towards me as well, uh, which is good, team celebration improvement. So um, to continue a little bit, being meta position viewer, mm -hmm. I like what's coming in. However, I haven't seen that many, you know, like concrete metrics, concrete ways of measuring. Um, and I see that as slightly a problem impact I'd expect is to see Scrum Master less needed over time. I like that, but how do we notice that? How do we notice that we need them less now? And I can actually, so the reason why I'm talking about this is because I can actually see a bigger problem behind not using metrics, behind not measuring the impact. And that is really, let's say, threefolded. On the one hand, I can see that there is, there's been a misunderstanding of the Scrum Master role. Um, whenever I come, as I said, into an organization that are actually doing an agile transition or that have scrum teams um, or that want to implement scrum teams, I can see that there's a lot of discussion about who should take the scrum master role. And a lot of the time, it's not the discussion based on, well, what do we expect of the scrum master? And how, you know, how would we notice that this is the right person for that job? It's actually, okay, who do we, in this transition, who do we have left who hasn't got a new role yet? Um, and that is really not the best way to go about this. And a lot of the time it's um, project managers that are left in an agile transition because there's no new role for them. Um, and so a lot of the time project managers are turned into scrum masters, which sometimes makes sense because some of these project managers are great scrum masters, but sometimes it does not make sense because automatic or a project manager does not automatically make a good scrum master. It is a question of what are we expecting of a scrum master within a scrum team within a transition. And also the second problem to this is I can, a lot of time I can, um, when I see transitions happening happened over the past, let's say half year, and the result not having been what it was like what we did the transition for, um, I ask, okay, well, what about your scrum masters? I mean, aren't they the ones who are pushing the transition and who are, who are pushing towards agility? And then oftentimes management looks at me very confused, okay, what, what does this have to do with the scrum master? So it's it's very strange, which is, you know, why there, it, there needs to be a clear understanding of what's expected of the scrum master role. The second point is that I've also seen that good scrum masters are actually getting frustrated because their impact is not very clear. I've seen a lot of really great scrum masters um, who every single day of their lives, they go to work and actually look at improvements. They look at impediments. So there's this continuous spiral of we need to get better. We need to make sure that there's um, hindrances, impediments need to be removed. We need to make sure that the, the team has everything that they need. We need to make sure that the organization is moving to the right direction. But if you think about it, every single day, there's something, there's this spiral that's happening in their head. And if, they, if the scrum master doesn't see, okay, there is actually something improving. I am having an impact. A lot of these really great scrum masters start getting frustrated. So I've worked with quite a few scrum masters who have actually reached this point, and then we start talking about that, which is, in my opinion, way too late. And the third thing that I've noticed is that generally, due to historical reasons of how they've been used, metrics and KPIs are very much frowned upon. So when I ask, you know, like, what's, 
what's the impact that you as a scrum master want to have? How would you measure that? A lot of the time it's like, whoa, 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 hold on a second. We are not gonna measure my impact. No, no, no. This is gonna be abused. This is gonna be misused. Um, metrics and KPIs are very bad. Um, and so this is kind of, these, let's say, these are the three elements that I see which lead to this problem of us not often not knowing the performance of a scrum master, um, especially scrum masters for themselves. So um, in order to, let's say, move forward on this and actually get into the metrics that, I, that I've come up with slash that I've discussed with a lot of Scrum Masters, um, and there are plenty more, more than what I'm bringing um, here today, um, let's go back a lot and actually look at what the Scrum Guide says about the Scrum Master. And the Scrum Guide says, the Scrum Master is accountable for the Scrum team's effectiveness. Okay, so this is really what it says in the Scrum Guide. Um, I hope you all know this image. It's Ian the Scrum Master. Just have a look um, on YouTube. It's a very cute little clip by Jeff Sutherland. Um, four minutes, quite fun. Um, so if the Scrum Master is accountable for a Scrum team's effectiveness, we want, of course, the Scrum Master to make sure that the Scrum team's effectiveness is stable. But seeing as he's a, he or she is accountable, we want the um, Scrum team's effectiveness also, of course, to rise over time, because this is why we have this role, right, the Scrum Master. So for this talk, and for also for my work um, uh, in my daily business, I um, split the Scrum Master's, um, let's say, L, uh, the Scrum Master's role, the Scrum Master role into three elements, the facilitator, the change agent and the servant leader. A great scrum master actually combines all three of these and makes sure that um, all three are actually touched. So when I look at facilitation, I'm not entirely sure how it works in Polish. My Polish is really not that great, um, but I can tell you how it is in German. The word facilitation, when you translate it into, into German, it's oftentimes um, meant in terms of moderation, so meeting facilitation. So a lot of the scrum masters that start, scrum masters that start off as scrum masters actually only focus on meeting facilitation. However, if you actually look at the original English word, um, facilitation, um, there's a lot more than just facilitating meetings. There's also facilitation of the scrum process, facilitation of learning. So also when it comes to improving the, the, the team's effectiveness, it is also improving the team's effectiveness when it comes to learning. This is why you need a facilitator for learning. Um, so it's not just based on meetings, okay? So this is really important. Um, the, second, the other two, of course, change agent and servant leader will go into them in a second. Um, so when thinking about, okay, how can I as a Scrum Master have an impact and how can I measure that? I have now, uh, well, I will provide you now with five metrics for each of these three elements. So at the end of this talk, you will have 15 new ideas for new metrics um, and ways of you know, measuring yourself if you're a Scrum Master or uh, ways of you know, maybe hinting the Scrum Master that, that you work with uh, towards these metrics. So let's get moving. Let's look at the metrics of the facilitation. And you will be given these slides in, in like afterwards, or you can, I think this talk is also recorded. So you can always go back to them and actually have a look again if I'm going too fast. The first metric, um, as I said, facilitation, of course, also includes meetings, but it's not just for facilitating meetings. But I want to, as a Scrum Master, I want to increase the meeting efficiency. Um, we've all been in meetings like the one on the cartoon. Um, nobody wants that. Um, how do I measure that? Well, I could have a look at, let's say, the average cost of my team members. Um, in every country, it's different, but you, you kind of have a, you, you kind of know what it is. Um, you could have a look at, you know, how many min minutes do you actually save due to meetings becoming shorter because they are more efficient. And that is pretty much how much money you as a Scrum Master are saving your organization, just when it comes down to meetings. Why do I want that? As I said, facilitation of meetings. The nice thing is that um, depending on the metric, you can actually do this yourself or you can do, you need some other people, typically your team to actually measure, measure that. So I've, I've put up this little stamp saying, do it yourself. Um, this of course is just one way of measuring that. 
The second metric that I've got for you is, um, as we said, the Scrum Master is actually um, there to increase or to, to ensure um, effectiveness of the team. We also want um, to increase the meeting effectiveness. How do I do that? Well, option one, of course, is um, to measure the, the ROTI, the return on time invested. So for example, you're investing now 50 minutes into this talk, 30 minutes talking, 20 minutes Q&A, but it's, it will be a 50 minute um, investment on your side. So the question is at the end, you know, was this a very good investment of your time or was it not? So I like doing um, roti flip charts in a um, in-person world, in a pre-COVID world. But now of course I do this, you know, with posting into the chat or posting it on Miro, um, et cetera. So there's lots of options nowadays. Um, the second option of course is also to just um, keeping a tally. So I do that as a scrum master a lot, um, or even as a meeting facilitator, it doesn't matter whether scrum master or not. Um, I, I believe that a meeting is most effective if everyone who is present actually is involved. So what I have is I have a checklist on the side of my, on my table and actually write the names of the participants and make sure that everyone um, participates. So everyone should add something to the meeting. Um, in order to, of course, see whether the meeting was more effective or not. And I can keep track of that over time, and I will see whether meetings um, have improved or not, whether the meeting effectiveness has improved or not. Metric number three. So what do I want? I want to see a rise in the team's bus factor. I hope you all know what the team's bus factor is. Some of you probably will, some of you might not yet. Um, it's, a very, it's a very dark metric, um, but I still really like it. I don't know if you know, but Viennese humor is very dark. Um, so the bus, um, bus factor is really about, um, imagine at the end of the day um, of, of your work day, your team goes home and they all cross the street and there's a bus coming. How many of your scrum team or yeah, scrum team members can get run over by a bus and the product still works? So the project that you're working on or the product that you're developing can still continue to be developed. That is your bus factor. So if your bus factor is one, meaning if one person, you know, the, the right person, the expert person gets run over, then the whole thing has to stop. You've got a real problem. So your bus factor should be as high as possible. So if you've got a team of five, ideally it would be five. Um, worst case, it's one. So you want to make sure that your team's bus factor rises. How do you do that? Well, you go and look at um, what the skills matrix is of your team. So you need to have a look at, um, you know, to seeing as what, what kind of skills you need in order to build the product that you're building or in order to develop the project that you're developing or the, the, the software, et cetera, um, you need to actually have a look at what's needed in terms of skills and who has those skills. And over time, you will make, have to make sure that actually um, the know-how is transferred and there's learning happening amongst your team members. So this is very, um, it's a very, very, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very clear on this is where you need to facilitate learning. Metric number four, I'm pretty sure all of you Scrum Masters who have taken on a new team or have, have introduced Scrum um, to other people know this one. Um, we want to measure the increase in the understanding of Scrum. How do we do that? Again, you know, all of these metrics are quite simple because if they're not simple, nobody will use them. Um, we want to keep a tally of the amount of times that, for example, per sprint, the Scrum Master actually has to discuss why and what the Scrum meeting is for. So why do we have to have the Scrum, Master, the Scrum meeting and what it is for, so why it's important to have it. Keep a tally, again, so just, you know, make... Um, um, what's it called, make dots or make something um, on in terms of, okay, so within the team, this and this many people ask me in this group, uh, sprint, for example, why do we need a sprint retrospective? Why do we need to have a daily standup, et cetera? Or um, also people outside of the team. So if this decreases 
uh, you have two options. Either uh, people have given up on asking, so they're tired and um, you've tired everyone out, which is probably not the best thing. Um, or option two, uh, which is the better one, people have actually started to understand what it's for. So you're facilitating um, the, uh, the understanding of Scrum and you're, you're making sure that everyone's understanding the, the practices, the rules, the values, um, so the entire Scrum process, let's say. So that, that would be hopefully the good thing. Um, metric number five, we want to, to decrease the amount of time and money lost to context switching. So this, this graphic here, um, it's, it's Weinberg's um, study on context switching. So he actually has proven that um, the more projects you take on, and you can even take this as the more tasks you do in parallel, the more time, which is you can see in red here, the more time is lost due to context switching. So for example, if you have one project or one task that you're working on, all of your time will be spent on that. If you work on two projects or two tasks, 20% um, of your time will actually be spent um, on context switching. So you will lose a lot of time. And once you've taken on three projects slash three tasks, this will actually shift and you'll spend more time um, actually uh, in context switching than on individual projects. So we really want to decrease the, 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 um, the loss due to context switching. So we want to increase focus, one of the big scrum values. How do we measure that? So we could, for example, keep a tally on every interruption from outside the team, um, which we had not planned on for the sprint. So this can be anything from you sit in the pre-COVID, you sit in a team, team room and actually see how often the phone rings um, and people call for things that have nothing to do with what you're building. This could be um, management requests that come in. This could be anything. Just make sure that you actually have interruption buckets or um, you know, like just some kind of visualization of what's coming in that is, um, that is hint or that is uh, causing your team to switch context continuously. Um, so just make sure to actually be transparent about that. So looking at the next metric, set of metrics, looking at servant leader. Scrum Master metric number six, as a servant leader. Servant leader, there's a lot of images going around of what that is. I really like an image that can be misunderstood very easily. Um, however, I just really like it. Um, the servant leader to me is kind of like a, a shepherd dog um, running or like if you go into the meadows and if you look at how farmers work with their sheep or their cows um, and with shepherd dogs, it's actually the shepherd dog guides and leads the, the, the flock of sheep back to the to safety, back to back to where they need to go. But why I like this image is not because, you know, I'm comparing with animals. This is not what I'm trying to do, but it's actually I like this because the the shepherd dog goes around the flock of sheep and it goes around and makes sure that everyone knows which direction to go into and that everyone kind of has what they need um, in order to be able to get there, to get to the common goal. So this is what I mean with servant leader. On the one hand, serving and running around and making sure that everyone has everything. But on the other hand, with this running around, um, actually leading the, the, the team into the right direction. This is, this is why I like that image. So this is what I mean with servant leader um, when I look and what I mean with it when I look at the next five metrics coming up. So metric number six, this again is somewhere where you need others. Um, as a servant leader, you want to increase the individual happiness and the team happiness. Why do you want to increase that? Because of course, people who are happy at work, they perform better. We know this, there's plenty of studies. So how do we measure that? We can, option one, actually do a daily happiness index. Um, again, this is a pre-COVID option to put it on the wall or during COVID, of course, you can do this you know, online. There's tools for that. There is, uh, you can do a mirror board, you can do conversations, you could, you know, like that there's plenty of ways to do that nowadays. Um, and just have the employees actually as it, as it shows here on the graphic, you can either do draw smileys, you can do um, 
um, dot rating. You can do post-its with numbers on it. So on a scale from one to 10, uh, there's various options here. Um, and other option, of course, is to do this a bit more professionally. I don't know if you've worked with Gallup before um, or the five dysfunctions for team check. So these are, for example, paid options where you can actually measure the, the team happiness slash the individual happiness. Again, why do we want that? We know that um, people who are happy at work perform better. So we want to improve team performance. Scrum Master metric number seven. We want to raise the team spirit. Again, because people who are happier at work, you know, they, they work um, more effectively, more efficiently. How do we do that? Um, in my opinion, uh, there's the unplanned overtime index would indicate that very well. The unplanned overtime index, why do I find this important? Um, in Scrum, we work in sprints. Um, every sprint starts with a sprint planning. And in the sprint planning, we actually plan what we believe or what the team believes that they will be able to deliver until the end of the sprint. Um, you know, there's sometimes the talk of commitment, um, but at least, you know, there's a planning of the next two weeks. And um, the unplanned overtime index actually shows um, whether this planning was done well or not. So if somebody stays late all the time, if somebody works overtime all the time, even if they've gotten all in contract or not, um, there is still overtime. And if they are doing overtime, that is not that is not good for the team spirit. Because on the one hand, of course, it shows that the planning was not done well. And on the other hand, it also shows that the team is not really working as a team because if one person is always staying late, um, it sh that shouldn't happen. It should either be the whole team stays late because they, they messed up in their, in their planning um, or it's nobody stays late. So um, this can be done again, either really um, in person with, let's say, filling a vase with marbles, with golf balls, with gummy bears, it doesn't matter. Or again, on Miro, you can do a visualization or in other tools. Why do we want that? Um, yeah, improve the, the scrum values. And we've got one big scrum value there. It's called commitment. Scrum master metric number eight. Um, what do we want to do now as a servant leader? We want to improve predictability. How do we measure that? We measure that by actually showing the commitment during the sprint planning versus what's actually been delivered at the end of the sprint. So this kind of ties in with the metric before. Um, with one of my past clients, uh, this is a while ago, I actually did this with a management team um, where they um, committed in weekly sprints, committed to their goals. So it was not um, story points or something. It was the number of goals that they would actually reach. And you can see on the graphic that actually this is... Um, they were very, they, they thought they would do uh, more than they actually were able to do due to a lot of reasons. They overcommitted at the beginning a lot. And then at some point they started realizing this and it actually got better and they would actually reach what their commitment, even when they split into two teams, they still managed to reach their commitment. So just by making sure that it's transparent, um, we again had a focus on scrum value called commitment. So this is one, one way of actually measuring the improvement of predictability, which is, by the way, one of the main reasons when I asked management, why did you introduce um, Scrum or why are you introducing agility to your, to your company? Is actually a lot of the time it's we want more predictability. So this is, this is a great measure. Metric number nine, six more to go, seven more with this one. We want to increase the self-reflection of the team. Um, how do we do that? We want to increase, we want to see an increase in the number of impediments. So we're talking um, the number of impediments or hindrances, or actually you could also do it the other way around. So we want to see an increase in the ideas for continuous improvement that the team voices itself. So again, um, it's actually the same client here. Um, in retrospect, after the after the project ended, we, or not the project, but like the, let's say this scrum introduction ended, um, we, had, um, we had a review by the management. They wanted to know, okay, well, does it actually make a difference um, when you introduce scrum? And so we, we had a look at, um, 
and at certain ways of measuring it. This was in hindsight. I wish I would have we would have done it in in uh, beforehand already back then. Um, and we actually because this was a production um, company, we we figured, okay, hold on a second. In a production company, there's a lot of uh, lean kaizen that they're already working with. So there's this continuous improvement process that had already been. Um, been happening before we actually arrived um, and introduced Scrum. So actually, have it, let's have a look at how many um, improvement ideas have been handed in before we introduced Scrum, and then actually have a look at how many continuous improvement ideas were handed in after or while we were introducing Scrum and see if there's a difference. Because again, this has a lot to do with actually fostering self-organization and this mindset of continuous improvement. And voila, it was like that. Um, that we saw a big difference between before, before going agile, so before introducing Scrum and after introdu having introduced Scrum. So there was, there was a lot more focus on continuous improvement. And this was all coming from the team. None of that came from me or from, from management. Metric number 10, we also want to increase satisfaction for the Scrum Master stakeholders. How do we do that? Um, I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with the um, uh, Management 3.0 concept of merit money. Um, merit money is kind of a, how do you call it, like a reward scheme. Uh, where fake money um, is, is passed amongst each other. So what I'm trying to say is uh, the team sits down and actually discusses, um, okay, well, how much do you help in this sprint? How much do you add in this sprint? How much, um, how much value are you adding? How, how happy am I with this? And you actually distribute kind of a bonus system amongst each other. So it's not a bonus system by the company or by the management, it's a bonus system amongst each other. This is called merit money. You can have a look at it also afterwards. And you could actually take this concept from three, uh, management 3.0 and actually apply it to your, um, to the to the concept of actually measuring the scrum master so you could change it in terms of um how much money from your budget would you spend on your scrum master because we all know the project budget right or the product budget and then um because this is super important make sure to actually discuss what would it make it worth the investment and why what would you spend the money on instead and why so please um yeah, just, just make sure that if you do talk about this with your team, and I know this is a very open conversation with your team, just make sure not to talk about, okay, what's the Scrum Master worth? No, the idea is to talk about, okay, what would make it worth um, while, what would be the investment instead and why? Option number two, of course, as always, also use scales on a scale from one to 10. How supported did you feel by your Scrum Master in the sprint and why? You can do this every now and again. You can do this, especially in the retrospective. You could also do this in the sprint review, etc. Going to the last set of metrics, and I'm already closer to, to the end of this talk. Um, we want to decrease the internal costs as a change agent. How do I do this? Well, every Scrum team actually knows its velocity. And so we can break down again, at the very beginning, I talked about the cost of the team members. Um, you can look at the cost of your sprint, how much does the sprint cost? So you can actually um, calculate what the cost of the story point is. And the nice thing about this is um, it's, it's quite good to um, measure because the Scrum Master is not actually estimating. So there's no chance that the Scrum Master could manipulate the, the metric of this. Okay, so we want to raise, uh, sorry, we want to decrease the cost per story point, so by raising the velocity. Metric number 12, we want to, of course, also reduce waste in the organization. How do we do that? Well, we can have a look at the money that we save because we removed impediments. Um, maybe useful could be um, Don Reinertsen's cost of delay, if you have a look at that. Um, that, might be, that might be quite good to measure the money saved by removing impediments. Why do we want that? We want to increase the value flow within the organization, the productivity, the effectiveness of the team. Metric number 13, we want to increase the decision-making power of the Scrum team. How do we do that? Um, or, um, I mean, why do we do that? Well, because we want teams to become self-organized, right? Self-managed. How do we do that? 
well, we can measure the number of impediments that actually still have to be escalated because they can't be solved by the Scrum Master or the Scrum team. If impediments can't be solved by the team itself, then of course um, the team can only be self-organized slash self-managed um, to a certain extent. So we really want to make sure that the Scrum team has decision power, decision-making power. Um, so we can actually still, um, again, keep a tally on the number of impediments that have to be escalated to management um, if we want them solved. We want a faster self-organization. Second to last metric, we want to speed up the value flow to the customer. I think this one is an obvious one as well, because we can track and, um, of course, in the end, decrease the lead time. So when I talk about the lead time, I'm talking about Hi, I'm a user, I'm a customer, this is the idea that I have, or I'm product owner and this is the idea that I have. Um, it goes into the backlog, at some point it comes into the sprint, at the end it's hopefully delivered, it goes live, somehow the users can use it already, can feedback on it. From idea to actually um, super happy customer slash feedbacking customer, that's the lead time. We want to decrease that so we can measure whether the Scrum Master has improved the effectiveness of the team by just um, making sure that the lead time is going down. Last metric, we want to increase the customer value. How do we do that? Um, a lot of companies actually do that already. They um, look at the net promoter score. So how likely is it that you would promote, uh, that you would recommend our product or our company to, to somebody else? A lot of companies use that or option two, of course, you can always ask in a sprint review, you can ask your stakeholders for feedback on a scale from one to 10, how satisfied are you? Um, this you could say is actually more of a product owner metric. However, if you think about the fact that the Scrum Master is not only there for the development team, but also there to coach and assist and help the, um, the product owner, this is of course, a super important metric for the Scrum Master as well. So now that we've heard 15 metrics of how, or let's say ideas for metrics, because there's plenty more, um, what do we do with them? What do I suggest? I very much suggest to use this for continuous self-reflection. What do I mean with that? Have a look before you start with any metric. What do you actually want to achieve with Scrum? Why are, you doing, why are you doing this? Then make sure that you're actually that you actually have an alignment with your organization. So have a look. What does your organization actually want to achieve with Scrum? Why did they introduce that? Why are they you know, wanting to work in an agile way? Make sure to be aware. How do you want your team to be different in X amount of time? Do you want to do this on a sprint level? Do you want to do this on half a year level? Do you want to do this in, I don't know, per year? What habits actually do you want them to change? Have a look at yourself. Every Scrum Master is different. Where can you add most value? What can you measure? Where do you think that your strengths lie? This also has to do, of course, with how would you define yourself as having been a good Scrum Master? If you, would, if you were to leave the team tomorrow, how would you define yourself as having been a good Scrum Master? And then at the end, only go to what would be good metrics to actually support these reflections? How could you measure that? How could you measure the value that you're adding? And how does this pay into the overarching organization goal? Once, you've had, once you have your metrics, once you know what you want to achieve, make sure that you actually use these metrics as grounds for conversation. Metrics should not be anything else but be a ground for conversation to improve together. Um, make sure that you use these metrics as a way of um, managing expectations, you know, managing expectations from the rest of the organization towards you as a Scrum Master. Um, make sure to also, when you have these metrics, when you know what you want to um, improve and what you want to measure, actually get the empowerment, okay? So make sure that everyone is aware of what you need in order to have that kind of impact, because a lot of these things are not easily done. Um, you can also use this in your assessment with your Agile coach. So for example, um, when you're working with other Scrum Masters, um, just make sure, okay, are you, just to coach each other, okay, where do you want to get to with your metrics, you know, because there's a big, there's a big gray area between a perfect team and a uh, not so great team. Compare your job description to reality. So this is also a very good, good way of um, measuring the impact. 
And last but definitely not least, use these metrics as an argument for your next pay rise. Um, before finishing off, because um, when you do work with metrics, there is a reason that metrics are frowned upon by a lot of organizations and a lot of people in working with these organizations. Please make sure that the chosen metrics are sustainable. Okay, just don't just look at quick wins because there's no point. These metrics are again a grounds for conversation. Quick wins aren't. Make sure to use a variety of metrics. So play around with them, try different ones. Just have a look at what um, you know what's best for the situation or for for the value that you're trying to add. Be aware that you're in a complex environment. So make sure that you're not measuring the result, but make sure that you're looking at actually the direction that the metrics are pointing you in. This is one point that I've gotten a lot of critique for. Um, I still think it's important. Uh, experiment with the metrics, but think about what you want to tell your team from the beginning, because people will or could act differently. So for example, if you're telling um, your Scrum team that you will be looking at um, the cost of a story point, it could mean that they start um, estimating a bit differently subconsciously because they want to help you. So think about, you know, maybe it makes sense to start measuring. And then when you have some results, actually sit the team down and talk to them about it um, and, and then change the metric again. Always measure in relation to the past. So don't compare yourself or anything, don't look into the future and continuously change metrics to trick the system. The don'ts, of course, because there's this famous, um, this famous quote by Goldra, tell me how you measure me, I'll tell you how I behave. So please, when you're working with metrics, don't use the same metrics too often. Um, the metrics evolve as a team evolves and your organization evolves. Always look behind the numbers to understand them. As I said, please use them as grounds for conversation. Don't just take the metrics and then, you know, that, that's that. Use them to talk. Um, don't abuse the data you collect. So make sure that this is all anonymous or, you know, somehow an anonymized uh, so that it doesn't hurt anyone. Don't compare teams or scrum masters. This is a huge no-go. This should not be what it's about. And don't annoy your team. So make sure to do some of these metrics that you can do on your own. Gamify them, simplify them, etc. Having said most of this already, What's the call to action for Scrum Masters? Um, think about how you want to measure yourself, start measuring, gather the data, analyze it, take it to your stakeholders, to your team, your management, other important stakeholders, use it as a ground for conversation and start at step one. Call to action for non-Scrum Masters that are in this talk, uh, sorry, in this audience, go and talk to your Scrum Master. So wrapping this up, um, there were three, three elements that I wanted to kind of combine and make sure that this is all, um, that there's a solution for them. The misunderstanding of the Scrum Master role, the good Scrum Master is getting frustrated, metrics and KPIs frowned upon. If we mix them, change them around a bit, I'm pretty sure that metrics um, can you be used um, to measure the impact of a Scrum Master and that will lead to better understanding of the Scrum Master role and to good Scrum Masters not getting frustrated anymore. If you have any questions, or if you want to tell me anything about other metrics uh, that you've been using, I will be in the Slack channel um, and I will be on the gather tool um, in, in some of these uh, chat rooms, if you wish. Thank you for Perfect. listening. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, it was very inspiring uh, presentation and there was very concrete measurements. So, so I, really good. I think many Scrum Master will use it. But still there is a few minutes left to at least few questions. So without further ado, I will go to the first one. Why are you trying to find a way to assess the work of Scrum Master who is the part of the Scrum team? Uh, I've, I suppose instead of assessing the whole team. Um because I think that there's a lot of metrics already, or there's a, let's say it's very obvious whether the Scrum team or the development team, so part of the Scrum team is actually doing a very good job. That's very easily measurable. Same with the product owner. So with the dev team, we can see whether, you know, something goes live, whether the customers are happy, whether there's lots of bugs coming back, etc. So that's quite easily seeable, realizable. Same with the product owner. If the product owner makes the customers happy, make sure that the the right things are being developed. This is very easily 
um, seen. Whereas with the Scrum Master, a lot of it is very soft, let's say. Um, it's not that easily realizable whether a Scrum Master is doing a good job or not. And so this is what I meant in the beginning with um, good Scrum Masters don't actually get the appreciation from the company that they are doing a really good job. Um, and a lot of the time, bad Scrum Masters are not getting like it's, it's not getting noticed that they're actually not doing what is expected of a scrum master. A lot of the time that just has to do with the fact that the company is not sure what a scrum master is supposed to do. So this is, this is kind of what I'm, I'm trying, trying to get up with the metrics. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Uh, the second one uh, relates to, to the meeting and to validating the value which meetings brings. How do you measure the rise of effectiveness thanks to the meeting? So it, the, um, I had this one metric um, with the return on time invested. So if, for example, at the end of the meeting, I ask, and I do this regularly in my meetings, at the end of the meeting, I ask my participants to actually post into the chat, or if I'm using a mirror board, I have some kind of visualization there. I ask them to actually, on a scale from one to 10, tell me how, um, how much, um, how, how much worth the meeting was. So as you have the return on investment, the ROI of an organization, you can do the same with the return on time invested with the meeting. So for this, for example, we've now spent 45 minutes. Um, what's the return on the time that you've invested? Was it a good okay. conversation or not? And that has to do with the effectiveness. Uh, okay, so this is the, uh, the feeling of the participant of the of meeting. Course. Of course. Uh, to go coming to five fifth matrix context switching i wonder how much it is about educating po versus developers what is your opinion um i'm not entirely sure what is meant by the question so the product owner typically brings in the focus of the sprint in the sprint planning right and this is a conversation between the product owner and the development team of what the the focus within the sprint planning should be uh, sorry within the sprint should be um so this is this is this is a clear you know parcel that we can wrap up and that's delivered at the end of the sprint but what I'm talking about is actually the um, other things that are coming in, colleagues from other teams, management um, that has nothing to do with, with, the, with the, the delivery of this one sprint that come in and want something from somebody. Um, so this is kind of the context switching that I'm talking about. So I'm not talking about the sprint delivery itself. I'm talking about things that are not planned in the sprint. Okay, thank you. Uh... And uh, we have uh, time for the last one question. Where, um, uh, it is probably safe to assure that each metric separately can be toxic in some context. Do you often pick a number of them in parallel? Yes. Uh, use several ones. So this is what I meant with have a look at what you want, what value you want to bring to your team, what value you want to bring as a scrum master to your organization. Um, and then think about how you could measure that. And there will definitely be several ways. And I would very much suggest to have several metrics at the same time, not just one. And then depending on your organization, keep it to yourself. So just measure yourself. Don't tell the organization, don't tell your management, don't tell your team, don't tell your PO. Just keep it to yourself and um, maybe use it with your agile coach that you're sparring with or use it with another scrum master that you're sparring with. And then when the time is ripe, then start talking to people about what you've been measuring. So depending on the environment that you're in, make it more transparent, make it more open for discussion or keep it to yourself and have it as your own personal um, improvement metric. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you very much, Stephanie. There is still many questions left unanswered. So please be welcome to the channel dedicated to your speech when probably many people will come because uh, many discussion took part in the, in the channel during your presentation. So I think that many questions will arise uh, in this channel. Excellent. And uh, if you want to learn something more about Stefani, uh, her work and achievements, you can find this information in her website. I will put the link in a chat on Slack. Thank you very much once again. 
and after okay. a short break, uh, uh, and after a short break, Michael Katzpschak will share the art of launching successful product by on, based on Boosty. So stay tuned for more agile by example. <laughs> 